Hello you multi-mixed Melodian malt munchers. It's a malt mansion and a big malt mansion credit to uh, Walter Axel 4300 who is providing the malt mansion for Ralphie Review. It's an extras 992 and I have just reviewed one of the first releases of Loch Lee Distillery. It's a lowland distillery and I am delighted as a whiskey reviewer to see more lowland distilleries and how much there is more appreciation for them in the modern whiskey scene and we see this demonstrated by Daff Mill Distillery for example or the recently um, repackaged Bladnach not so much with Glen Kinchy. I know it can be, it can actually be a really good whiskey, but unfortunately it's just too sanitised, as is Auchentoshin. Um, I mean, if you can get Auchentoshin from independent bottlers where this, the complexity of the finish, the delicacy of the whiskey is allowed to express itself without being cut off by chill filtration, then go for it. Um, but it's lovely to see a resurgence and to see more lowland single malt distilleries. This is an important part of the pantheon of Scotch whiskies. And what's particular about this is it's really young. This is no more than three, maybe four years old. And certainly in the old days, in the primitive days of whiskey, before the war, so we're talking about 1930s, 1940s, um, certainly round about prohibition, you got some seriously young whiskey, cheaply made whiskey, gushing out of Campbelltown from its 21 to 23 odd distilleries, perhaps more, you never know. And um, it was heading over because such was the demand and supply ratio and also the lack of sophistication in the customer. And this is one reason why during Prohibition cocktails became so popular because it was a great way of masking inferior spirit, was to mix it with sugary stuff and colourful dyes and stick an olive in or a slice of pineapple and tart it up a little bit so that people didn't pay, mind paying too much for the product. You know, the, the cocktails started with very humble origins. They are not these uh, bizarre concoctions and sometimes monstrosities that they are today, these acts of theatre rather than anything to do with flavour. And yeah, that's my opinion. I very rarely consume cocktails. If I have a cocktail, it's probably a single malt whiskey with an extra drop of water. I'm a bit old fashioned that way and I have no regrets about it. So here we have a modern whiskey which is particularly young and it's not for everybody's taste and it certainly isn't for everybody's budget. It is relatively expensive in my opinion for something so young and yet at the same time people will go into a shop and buy a bottle of vodka for the same price or a bottle of gin. So figure it out, you know, it's choices Courses for courses and choices for customers. That's what it's all about. But I just want to give you some overview about how the presentation of whiskey has changed over the last few decades. And I want to start really with the 70s, which were very simple times for specifically single malt whiskies. Plenty of blends out there, blends many of which no longer exist because the blenders couldn't get the quality of supply they needed. They ended up bottling crap, people tasted it, they didn't like it, they moved on to another brand. There was very few brands actually held on, like Johnny Walker, Chivas Regal, Dewar's and... Another good example, Bell's, great example, Famous Grouse, yet another. Why did these blends survive? Because the bottlers had the depth of supplies in warehouses and were frequently producing their own single malt and grain whiskey to actually create their blends so they controlled the line of supply. That's why these blends have tended to survive right up to this day. But let's focus on single malts now because single malts, you, I remember as a kid, 
uh, my dad got five year old Rosebank. I loved it. He thought this was an absolute connoisseur's treat. And he gave me a sniff and he gave me a taste and I thought it tasted like fire water, but I was just a young kid at the time. And when I was raiding his drinks cabinet, I preferred Kahlua because the bottle looked exotic and it tasted like toffees because it was very sugary sweet. So there you go. You gotta start somewhere, you know, when you're four years old. Um, and that's what I, how I started. Uh, oh, fond memories. But coming forward to when I was in my teens, um, you know, in my early 20s, it, it was, you know, some would, would get off a, a wee dram and it was usually a blend. And I wasn't even thinking about age statements. They were pretty irrelevant. But I did overhear a conversation from my dad's friends talking about the fact that they'd got some Glenfarclas and it had a 10 year old age statement on it or they'd got a Talisker and it had a 5 or an 8 year old age statement and they were at that point they were talking about the longer of wood, the length of wood made the whiskey more creamy and smooth uh, and this was a, a perfectly acceptable point of reference in those days because palettes were far less sophisticated and people literally had simpler tastes and the accessibility of, of whiskies was far more restricted because the top end single malts of the time of the moment, you know, your Macallans, for example, your Taliskers, your some of your Isla malts, Bowmore specifically, good example. You'd only find them in the bars, high class bars of, of four star, five star hotels. And there was, it was very much a separation between the classes and the socio-demographic, that the, just what, the mixing didn't take place. And as a result of which, people stuck to the brands that related to their status. So my dad being a librarian, so basically a lower level middle class, um, he would have the occasional malt, which would be Glenfiddich, non-age statement Glenfiddich. Hey, it's a single malt, it was smooth, it was grassy, it was easy to sip, he was perfectly happy, happy with it. He would occasionally have um, a blend, but he made sure it was loved up, something like Famous Grouse, the sherried version. So he had enough knowledge that he was looking for the better quality. So he avoided High Commissioner, for example, or you know some of the brands like Goblin. Um, I don't think, know if you've even heard of that. But when we're moving on a wee bit, as my dad was getting older, he got more into single malts, Talisk in particular. So he tried the 10 year old, and then he got a 12 year old, and then he got an independent bottle of Talisker. And because he had these points of reference, his palate became more sophisticated. So when a batch of Talisker 10 year old came out, which was rubbish, he immediately spotted it, he was spooked by it, and he never bought another bottle. And that happens a lot. Bad batches poison customer goodwill. Distilleries need to understand this. Don't play games with the customers. Bad batches don't work now. There's too much conversation, too much immediate feedback that's gonna call out bad batches because people are seriously disappointed and in the age of the internet, they want people to know. Back in those days, in the 1980s, people didn't know because how did you communicate? You didn't. You just went into maybe a specialist whiskey shop and some grey old chap behind his bifocal lenses wearing his wee bow tie would eye you up and down and assess what your worth was and then, then they would adjust their treatment of you accordingly. Very, very, very much the norm. Still is today in many respects, although it's more subtly done. And then they'd basically say, right, I'm going to sell you what, you know, you want an option to Talisker, right, oh, here's, here's the bone more. Here's, here's some, some, um, Lagavulin. So my dad tried the Lagavulin and he really quite enjoyed that. But ultimately what really got him back into single mox was Kalila 12 year old. Even more so when I gave him presents and gifts of independent bottlings from Caden Heads, from Gordon and McPhail and from, from um, Berry Brothers and Rudd, 
and immediately he clocked that they were superior delivery of the Kulila experience. He noticed that. So at least this time, as his tastes get more sophisticated through exposure and experience, you amplify it, ramp it up now into the 90s, the 2000s, and here we are at 2023. We have far more consumers, as the whiskey industry likes to refer to us as, who have seriously sophisticated palates because our palates are very instinctive and very accurate at the feedback they give us. Our palates subconsciously, subliminally, will tell us when a whiskey is inferior. So we're buying a bottle of 12 year old single malt something. Pick any single malt from any distillery. It has the age statement 12 years old on it. You think, right, that should be good. It's a little bit, bit more rounded than the 10 year old and not as expensive as the 15 year old. So you get a bottle of the 12 year old something and you think, hmm, right to, it's less than it used to be. And that is because the activity of the cask over the 12 years is less than it used to be because the freshness and the energy in the cask is less than it used to be because there's more demand now requiring more casks at which point the better casks are becoming thinner in the supply chain. When there's less demand, the better casks make up a higher volume of the supply chain to the distillers. And there's times that the distillers have to be beggars because they can't be choosers because they can't get the casks they need. They have to be inventive. They have to be creative. And this is one major reason why we now have ex-wine casks being used. Bariques, for example, which I have to say because many are made from pan-European oak are actually remarkably effective so long as the casks are rinsed out because depending on the style of a single malt whiskey a red wine cask or a white wine cask whether sweet wine or dry wine will either work or not work and you don't get much in between so wine cask finishes can be really hit and miss for a brand Madeira casks uh, they work every time. Marsala casks, I notice, they work every time too, except they're kind of sweet. They always have a sweet edge to them. But this is the the way things are, 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 are changing now. As the older age stated whiskies, the 21 year olds, the 25 year olds, the 30 year olds, are now steeply rising in price. And you're looking at all those years that the whiskey spent in the cask and you look at the price and you see it's 40% or 43% automatically you know it's chill filtered. It's castrated. It's deeply damaging. Not so bad with younger whiskies, fine for blended whiskies, but see for old single malts. It absolutely impacts badly on the complexity of delivery. And furthermore, what makes things more complicated is you can have all these different degrees of chill filtration and you can have non-chill non filtration which is just because it's just done in the winter time with the chill switched off to save energy because Scotland's cold in the winter. So they can say it's non-chill filtered but it's still been heavily filtered through loads and loads of filtering plates. So the only point of reference that you can take at this point is by looking at the mist in your glass. That's the only accurate you're going to feed back, knowing that if the whiskey's triple distilled or blended with a lot of column still whiskey, you shouldn't expect to see that mist. And if you do, it's only going to be slight. Whiskey's complicated. This is why uh, he, even at Ralphie Review 992, I'm still able to give you some fresh information based on my experience and observations that I've never even mentioned before. There is so much to learn. Whiskey's so complex. It's so amazing. It's so extraordinary. And I mean, I look, I go into a local pub now and again, and I look at the people around me buying rubbish right and they don't care about the quality 
they're only in there to get pissed and it's sad and they are they're undermining their health they're undermining their self-respect they're undermining their reputation because when they hear people around them who say nothing but their ears are waggling because they're listening in and hear them mouthing off and talking crap their reputation just starts to hemorrhage and when people see them in the street the following day sober they're acutely aware of what they heard the night before this is the way alcohol works this is one of the ways this is is such a complex situation so for the careful sippers that we are that we're looking at this bewildering variety now of not just scotch whiskey but global whiskey produced pot stills different pot stills loman stills column stills short column stills copper column stills very tall industrial column stills it's pot stills now made of stainless steel but lined inside with copper gauze and it, it, it starts to get bewildering you know it's difficult to keep up with all in the modern whiskey scene but what we have in our our favour is ongoing gradual steady experience and this is invaluable so when we we look at non-age statements whiskies we ask ourselves right first of all is it bottled with integrity 46 percent unchill filtered natural color that's a good start it's a good start quarter casks that's a good start but you know it should have an age statement i prefer it with an age statement but it's the quality of this the years of the aging you get if it's an age statement of 10 years if it's 10 good quality years good but if it's 10 poor quality years if they've re-racked or blended in some inferior cask the aid the value of the age statement starts to diminish and we want to keep our hobby affordable so we're looking for forget the 18 year old anything I'd, I'd, I'd really buy anything over 100 pounds when I am so that's anything over 21 years old it, it's off my radar now I'm not bothering so I'm looking for the excitement in the younger whiskies and the modestly matured whiskies and what I'm looking for is the quality of the event the quality of the experience that whiskey's had in its fabrication in its making before it's reached the bottle and if you've got a really young non-age statement whiskey that's best quality spirit best quality husbandry in the warehouse and the quality of casks the preparation of casks the management of these casks and it's a non-age statement young whiskey the chances are you can have a better experience than if you bought an age stated whiskey at 10 12 15 years old that had just spent the entire time in a mediocre cask which had been empty before it had filled and started to go sour and then what happens is the whiskey goes into it to mature for the x many years and because of the sourness in the cask because of the inferiority of the cask it actually takes away from the whiskey rather than adds to the maturing of the whiskey and this is something you very rarely hear about some maturation in warehouses depending primarily on the quality of the cask can diminish the whiskey over time if it's poorly selected casks poorly prepared casks poorly managed casks casks that have been spent too long empty going sour drying out just stagnating and you do get stagnant casks out there you absolutely do I've seen them you get a feel for it after a while when you see you know not necessarily in warehouses when, but when you do see in some warehouses and you talk to people talk to people who really know about casks it's it's complex malt mates but I would conclude by saying what's the hurry part of the fascination with whiskey is it's an extraordinary journey through a very varied landscape that landscape is full of mountains and valleys road rivers rail networks paths bogs peat bogs um, and amazing scenic views and all of it's delivered in the package of smell and taste 
and then over and above it, particularly online, you might not have anyone in your, your immediate vicinity who's a whiskey fan. But you will find this amazingly proactive, informative and sharing group online which has never existed before and it is quite spectacular actually how the internet is changing global whiskey. And I'll give you one example. I know for a fact that there are, are American single malt whiskey distillers viewing my channel at this moment in time because they are harvesting consensus across the internet to help guide them into what they are going to prepare their form of whiskey to be. They are looking at where whiskey is at at the moment and they are forward planning to what whiskey will be in five years so that what they produce now will be ready in years to come to supply to that market demand. This doesn't happen so often in Scotch whiskey. Unfortunately, Scotch whiskey industry is too conservative. It used to be a useful thing. It used to be a charming thing, but now it can be a dangerous thing for the industry. And this is why it heartens me that there's new distilleries appearing. Not all, I might add, not all, but some whiskey, quite a number of small whiskey distilleries, they are producing very decent whiskey, which in my opinion is going to stand the test of time. Even as some major highly established brands tend to resort more and more to the mass presentation of averaged, homogenised experience, um, where the smell and taste increasingly needs to be supplemented by more and more messaging and more and more discounting at specific times a year in order to sell the volume they're trying to sell to make a profit and sustain the business. It's a sign of the times. And this is what I'm here to commentate about. So I'm, I would finish off by saying, Whiskey is much more varied. Don't judge by the book by its cover. Do not judge by the label by anything more than the actual, actual tangible, valuable information which you're looking to give you proper bearings as to what expecting the, to expect in the experience. And also, bypass the supermarket. Bypass your travel retail where the prices are pretty steep. Go to your local specialist. If you happen to be lucky enough to have a professional one, a committed and engaged liquor specialist. Now that's not, to, um, you will find some liquorist, liquor, liquor stores are chancers, or at least some of the employers at them, employees at them are chancers. That's real life. But you've got to use your experience and your network, your online network, to find out who are the shops who have the reputation that you go to and you do some serious learning. Because you'll find that the person working in the shop, if, just if, they are engaged and connected with what they're doing and have a passion for it, they will know a lot about the whiskies they're selling. And they don't tend to mention that until they're asked. Feel free to ask them. Whiskey's so diverse now. That diversity will continue. Let's embrace that diversity. But keep in mind, it's fine so long as the quality justifies the price being asked. That is the key to the code. I'm Ralphie. Hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, click like, subscribe, and I'll just give this big red button a click and finish this video. Bye.